<laughs> hey, hey, Missy from New Zealand. Um, yeah, so uh, what I would love to do is we had a bunch of questions come in through our survey and sorry for those who signed up late, you didn't get a chance to do the survey, but good news. Uh, as a reminder for those who participated in the first and who, for those who uh, are joining us now, there is a Q&A. Feel free to use the chat. The Q&A, um, which I'm actually going to check all of these off now so that we don't get them confused. Um, so this is all about the negotiation, but what we'll do is please feel free to add additional questions here and then anyone can upvote them. Um, so ask away. We will get started pronto with our very first question. We're just gonna get right into it. So someone asks, I am employed and trying to break into tech while many who are uh, already in tech and have been laid off recently are job searching. So one, is it ethical for me to be looking right now when there are so many in need of jobs who are more qualified? Such a sweet question. And that aside, with so many qualified job seekers, how can I stand out with no tech experience? Who would like to take that first question? I'm happy to jump in on it. Uh, that question actually was really striking when I read it uh, because I can empathize so much with that feeling of there are so many other people in need. Who am I to want for or ask for something? Um, and so first and foremost, uh, if anybody out there needs this reminder right now, uh, it's so true that the, the better taken care of you are, the more capable you are to serve others. And so you seeking out a job that's a great fit for you and a great fit for a company is not you taking opportunity from others. It's setting you up to be able to give back and support others in achieving what they want. None of us can really help out our neighbors or be in a place to really be giving if we're not, our basic needs aren't being met. And so whether you have a job right now that you're really unhappy in or you are unemployed and looking for a job, either way, you deserve and are worthy of seeking out those opportunities. And in terms of this piece of like who are more qualified and or like don't have experience, um, my day job is working with folks going into tech and making that transition from a variety of different backgrounds. And so we talk about this all the time, that the most important thing to keep in mind is your definition of qualification is likely and at great, greatly potential uh, to be different than others definition of that. If you are eager, if you're excited, if you bring a different perspective to the table, there so many advantages and so my mantra in that is the goal is not to get a job in spite of your background in spite of the fact that you don't have maybe those technical skills that you think are necessary it's because of your background so looking for what do i bring to the table maybe in place of technical skills that i don't have because companies if you're looking at job descriptions and you're like i don't have most of these things thinking of it as a wish list and it's the company's best self-awareness to put together that wish list. They have a problem that needs solving, they have a pain point, and they think this is the type of profile of a person that can solve that, but they don't know what they don't know. And there might be a perspective that you bring to the table that can help to solve for that specific pain point or problem for them. So don't count yourself out uh, before you've even given yourself that shot. That's great. Please, Jenny. Oh, Jenny, Jenny, why did I say Hi, Jenny? I totally agree with Lacey. Um, tech is uh, my original bread and butter, um, but I've done a co couple career pivots from non-tech to tech, so I absolutely kind of can understand that. I would say do not feel guilty. You definitely have the game plan to move to tech, likely before COVID. So this was not an interest because of this time. So, you know, going after um, it is great. I would say kind of look into what your background is now. So if you are currently in education, your background could be relevant for any edutech companies, including online training or master class training uh, companies. Apparently, a lot of people have more downtime, so that industry is really growing right now. Or if you were in the service and food in industry, which I know was hit super hard, um, your transferable skills can move into places like delivery apps or Instacart or Shipt, which are all areas that are growing and they're part of the tech industry. So, and then finally, I would say you may already have contacts in your current, I guess, uh, group of people or in the past where they were in your current situation. They might have already moved to tech somehow, similar vertical, and you can reconnect with them and maybe they can give you some tips. Carol, did you want to add I mean, anything? all of that was beautiful. I would yeah, I know everything. I'm going to move on to the next question because I feel like that was answered extremely well. Sorry, totally. I'm shutting this. Completely agree. 
there we go. Well, you get to answer the first one. Yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll see what that <laughs> one is. <laughs> um, yeah, and actually, it, so we'll flip back and forth um, because uh, four people upvoted this one question, which so it's it's definitely a top of mind for folks that are here. Um, so someone wrote, how do you carefully address into leaving a company because of a horrible, toxic, emotionally abusive culture? Now you're not supposed to talk badly of any company. So this has been a challenge. Yeah, that's a really, I can jump in on that one. I, that's a really interesting question. And I agree. I always think that leaving a company on the best terms possible is like the goal, given the world is small, you never know who you're going to run into again. Um, I've like run into former clients that are then the VP of a department that I've been applying to, that sort of thing. So you you never know. Um, but I think that is the question, how do I like say that I'm leaving? I think it's like yeah, when you're applying you, somewhere else. Yeah. I think you can talk a little bit about maybe the culture not being a fit for you. You can be a little bit more vague you don't have to go into like this was a super toxic environment but you could say you know this wasn't quite the right environment for me or you could really focus on what about the new place you're going to really excites you and what about their culture that you think would be a really great fit for you or that role would be a really really great fit for you and kind of make the conversation more about that than what was wrong with where you were before okay. Yes, to jump in on that, I think keeping in mind that we have control of whatever narrative that we are sharing mm -hmm. and what we say, um, and that it's not just an interrogation where we're getting asked a question that we're beholden to have to answer it in any, you know, in some kind of certain way. It's it's what we want to share, and as much as you can, focusing on what you're moving towards rather what you're than what you're moving away from is always going to generate a much more engaging type of conversation. Anytime, right, we're engaged, it feels good to vent with friends maybe, but if you find yourself like drained after that, right, you, that's not the experience you're wanting to generate in this interview. It's trying to focus on like, what's the possibility that we're, we're hoping to create out of it. And it's not being disingenuous or dishonest not to acknowledge what didn't work, um, but it's an opportunity to really own, like when you think about, which is where self-awareness actually really comes into this, those things that are toxic that aren't working for you, what is what you're moving towards? What is it that you're wanting? And how do you self-advocate for that in the interview to make sure that that's like the space that you co-create with this company? Love it. Did you want to add anything, yeah. Jenny? Just a quick add to follow up what Lacey just said about the looking forward. I'm sure there's like company values or things that they talked about or doing your research about a company, like things that you're like, oh my God, this is the comp kind of company I want to be in. Just kind of pivot and focus on that and what you bring to the table based on those values. Love it all. Okay. Well, wow. Bunch mm -hmm. of upvotes for with an abundance of newly laid off employees in the job market, what can we do to set ourselves apart from the masses when applying to an open job listing? What are the top three things? Go. <laughs> well, I, I'll give one. Great. <laughs> perfect. <laughs> okay. So I'll use an actual example. Um, obviously there's layoffs. You're right. Every, uh, every day you're hearing about something. So I am very sorry for everyone who's on this, who's going through this even before COVID. I know it's a tough situation. I will say what stood out, um, you know, cause I'm on LinkedIn a lot and you hear stories of what people are doing. So I think how you can stand out, for example, is there is when you know someone's leaving, not every company create a list of people that are affected. And so in this particular case, this person, set themselves apart by saying, I'm one of those, but here are my, you know, 100 other mm -hmm. fabulous coworkers that they did not get, um, you know, displaced because of performance issues, any of those things. So she, uh, this person should be able to tell that story apart, like not just about themselves mm -hmm. being affected and how they really helped other people beyond mm -hmm. that. So nice. Oh, that's beautiful. I love hearing that so much. That, that's definitely a way to set yourself apart. And in addition, I, I agree, yes, uh, my heart goes out to everybody that's been affected by these recent layoffs. But I actually think that it's not, the things to set yourself apart aren't very different than what they always have been. Mm -hmm. And it really does come back to the idea of like, how am I giving something? How am I serving in some way? As opposed to like, what am I seeking to get out of it? So when you think of like applying on an applicant tracking system or an online portal where you're just submitting your resume, it's a very passive way 
to apply for a job in all honesty, right? You've got your resume, you probably have worked hard on it, but then you're just sending it off into this black hole and hoping something comes out of it. And so the best way to set yourself apart is to is to foster and establish and strengthen genuine human connections. Um, because it is cliche to say, but it's true. It's not what you know, it's who you know. And then you need to back it up with what you know in the interview process. But getting that foot in the door comes through generating those connections. And the best way to make those connections is by offering something meaningful. So whether that's on LinkedIn in a post that's public or if you are doing a direct cold message to somebody on a team um, that you're interested in engaging with, thinking really critically, doing your research to think what's a what's a pain point they might have that I could offer something to help out with. So I'm already showcasing the value add that I'm going to bring to this team um, as opposed to just like asking to pick their brain or asking for them to, to have my interest at heart. Mm. I love both of those. Um, and to jump off the, the LinkedIn idea, I think um, posting or writing your own articles, showing yourself as a thought leader in that space, or even just about something you're noticing right now. Um, you know, maybe it could be around like how I found my organization is helping to support one another during this time, or you know, something that might pertain to the type of role that you're you're doing. Um, I've had people say, "Oh, I read that article you posted on LinkedIn," and then dove into the conversation, talking to me about it before I even got to. The actual interview piece and so they took they showed that they took the time to actually research me and I was very glad that I had something there for them to look at um, so that's another way you can you can kind of amidst the digital noise um, set yourself apart I love that and um, this is actually related to um, I just got upvoted again very related to what you just <laughs> talked about which is uh, Lacey um, getting stuck um, with the networking calls not getting anywhere, are there other ways or maybe best practices for networking um, to get that first interview? I Can I jump in on that? Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I will specifically ask, would you mind referring me to this role? Making the clear ask of, you know, yes, it's great, your network, I mean, I, I, I've gotten every single job that I've ever had through networking. It's how I found most of my coaching clients, right? I'm a huge proponent of networking. Um, but you sometimes need to give a little bit people a little bit more direction about what you're specifically asking for. So, hey, I'd really love to learn a bit more about your company and your role and how you got there and start talking to them about it. But then if it seems like this is actually something I'm really interested in, they have an open role, would you mind referring me for this role and making that ask so they know what to do with it? Agree completely that like the clear call to action is so important, right? You have to ask for what you need so somebody can help you out in that way. Uh, but making it making sure that you've done your research and your work to figure out that this is a good fit. There's something about this company, about this team, about this position that really resonates with you, uh, as opposed to I'm looking for a first interview because I just need a job mm -hmm. versus like yeah. I've really looked at it and it's this job and this is the reason. And so I'd really mm -hmm. like your support because that makes it easier for that person to make that recommendation on your behalf also because they understand that you see where that mutual fit is. Yeah, please. Oh, Jenny, you're Hi. there. You go. A dollar for every time someone tells me I'm muted. <laughs> I'd be rich. <laughs> um, so what I was going to say was using even this event platform, the fact that you actually did that, you're actually networking, and it's not just networking mm -hmm. with the coaches. Of course, now you know how to stalk us on LinkedIn, but like <laughs> beyond that, you have also each other. So I was at this table, and I just simply asked everyone, can you tell me like what you, what you're great at, but then also what you can offer in terms of like networking. And we discover there's someone who's really, you know, tapped into the healthcare or health uh, tech market. And then somebody else was like, Hey, that's actually my background. So it's, it's through osmosis versus like, um, I'm going to network with someone. It's merely of like, I'm, how am I going to build uh, rapport and relationship and, be able to offer someone um, something that they could, you know, use. Love it. And this is very related to everything we're talking about. Good job, participants, asking these questions and upvoting in the correct order. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so do you have advice for networking tips as a new grad, especially not being able to physically go somewhere? I know you touched upon this being a platform, but there are other, are there other ways? 
I think that one of your greatest advantages um, is your alumni network as, as a recent mm -hmm. graduate, um, regardless of like the size of school that you went to. Um, I went to an itty bitty liberal arts school in Bulgaria with my college, which has like a entire the entire alumni community in the world is a couple thousand it's very tiny uh, but that having that as a starting point you never know when somebody has a connection somewhere and doing that linkedin research of even just setting it to like anybody that went to your alma mater to see who has that mutual a, some line of connection to a company that you're interested in and reaching out to them even if you don't know them the fact that you have a shared history of educational experience, it's a lot more likely they'll be willing to invest in you and vouch for you and open doors for you. People really like giving back, especially to people that have some kind of like continuity or connection to something that was meaningful in their own life. And for most people, their education was meaningful. So I would encourage you really to lean into that. Plus one. Yeah, I was going to say that. All about <laughs> that, was, that is a, totally, totally one of my yeah, most favorite ways to do that for sure. I, and I can just vouch for that because Carolyn, uh, her commitment to Middlebury College is unwavering. Um, she's very smart. Um, I love that. That's a great answer. Um, so uh, someone asked, how do you navigate being let go from your previous job during your job search? How much do you do you share in that process? Um, I would say during this time, it's okay to own it. You're among 20 million, 22 million uh, friends and counting. Um, somebody I saw on a LinkedIn uh, actually posted that they are on a four sabbatical due to COVID. Mm -hmm. And there was a little humor in it, but I think that's kind of the way they're approaching it. So I do think um, another way is, you know, being open said, you know, I had the foresight and I kind of knew, like I, I kind of understand where the company was going, where the industry is going. So I started my job search and it's just in the middle of it, this happened. But it gives you sort of like ability to say, I was able to be proactive and I've you know, been searching about your company and this is why I'm here. Love that. Does anybody else have anything to add? No pressure. No, I think Lacey had touched on this a little bit earlier for a different question, but like you own your story and your narrative. You don't have to divulge like, oh, I was laid off for X, Y, and Z reason. Um, again, right now is like so many people are, so you don't have to go into any explanation, but you also own your story and about why you're excited to make a change. And actually this might be, you know, something that you didn't expect, but is, is exciting for you and giving you a new opportunity to go find something that's a better fit, right? So, so create, create your own story around it and stay positive about that story. And it's a lot easier. Exactly. Like Both of those points and thinking about too, highlighting that as again, like this advantage of because of your background, you're the right fit. It's very similar um, to oftentimes it comes up with folks that have taken a career gap, whether for sabbatical to travel or to raise a family or as a caretaker or for a variety of reasons, people sometimes have gaps on their resume and that causes anxiety too. If I'm searching for a job and I don't have one, how do I frame, how do I speak to that if I get asked about it. Anything that you have anxiety about being asked in the interview process, you wanna anticipate and assume, I will be asked this, I will be asked, right? What am I in? Am I working right now? And so rather than then being caught off guard, how do I already think through that story to say, yes, this happened. And whether it's to Jenny's point about being proactive or to Carolyn's point about like being positive about what you're moving towards, um, knowing for yourself that you've already figured that out. So when you get asked that, you're ready to go with an answer. Love it, love it. And I've started to delete some of the other questions just because it was getting a little unwieldy, so it's easier to read. So uh, popular question is when networking and cold emailing, is it better to reach out to a recruiter or to the actual team members? It's a great question. I feel like, Ginny, you should answer that because you, you know, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> This is recorded, right? No, <laughs> <laughs> we don't have to publish it. <laughs> no, 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 I'm kidding. Face -face. I think what I would say is, yes, um, here, it really depends on if you're trying to apply to a smaller company, a startup where very easily on LinkedIn, you can probably identify, like if you're applying for a marketing specialist job, you probably want to look for the marketing manager. So it's like more direct. But when you're going after like big fang companies like the Microsofts or my old company, Facebook of the world, like there are titles that are similar. You won't be able to tell who's like actually the hiring manager. Mm. And I believe they have over 2000 recruiters right now. So like it's everyone kind of own different things. 
that's why I would say, you know, going back to this networking, you might want to, first of all, if it's a larger company, you might have um, people or even second or third, you know, connections that you can start tapping into. Um, I don't know if that helps. I, I feel like Caroline and Lacey probably have even like deeper perspective from outside the recruiting org, but just know recruiting is getting bombarded right now. So even with my team, I have to like figure out like who to send these to, but that's because I'm willing to do that. I would say not everyone would have the time or the capacity to do that. Yeah, I totally agree. My strategy is usually if I know someone or know someone else who works there, they don't need to be in the department whatsoever, but getting a person that actually isn't an interview, but you can have a little bit more of an informational conversation with around like, hey, can you tell me what it's like to work there? Get a little bit about that, you know, what are the values, the culture? What should I kind of know when I'm trying to, when I'm talking to recruiting or the hiring manager? And, you know, this is what I'm really looking to do. Would you introduce kind of that? Would you mind introducing me to the person? And that person will usually say, yes, I'm so happy. I would be more than happy to, you know, send your resume over, send it to me, that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, I actually normally recommend going, not even for the hiring manager or the recruiter, but like if you can find someone else you know or get connected in, that's a great place to start. Agree completely with all of these perspectives. Yes, I wouldn't I wouldn't focus just on that recruiter or hiring manager because agreed, it's hard to find that person. And if you have somebody else in the company that you can connect with, it's a likely to be a lot easier for them to figure that out on your behalf even, mm -hmm. and then they can provide that introduction. So to Jenny's point about recruiters are like over overloaded and their bandwidth is really limited. Uh, but in my experience, if they get an email from somebody that already works at the company saying, hey, you really should be talking to so-and-so, it bumps you up on their priority list as well. And so it helps to cut through that noise. Totally. I love it. I'll just quickly add, if you do see a hiring manager or recruiter posting about jobs on LinkedIn, mm -hmm. that's open invitation to go bug them. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, yeah. Fair if point. it says we're hiring, <laughs> go do it. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, LinkedIn is, I know that we're going to, our third webinar is going to be all about LinkedIn best practices. I'm sure we're going to talk a lot about all the, the great best practices for that. Um, okay, next question. Um, I love this question. How should you approach and handle getting ghosted by an employer? This person was in a final round at a company and then um, and had a call with the HR and the hiring manager and then was ghosted. That is terrible. Yeah, I'm so sorry that happened. I know. I've yeah, actually heard happens. of more people saying that's happened to them recently. And I, I'm like, when did ghosting become an acceptable thing in our world. Um, I think actually it's my, like dating. it's kind of like dating. Yeah. I think mm -hmm. my first reaction, and this is just how I live my life is assume positive intent, right? Mm -hmm. Right now is a crazy time mm -hmm. to be seeking a job, but also to be on the recruiting end, right? And you likely are slammed as Jenny was saying and juggling a ton of different candidates. And so you may have just dropped off their radar, not on purpose, not maliciously. So assume positive intent. If you have their email, send them an email and say, hey, I had these two conversations. I was really excited about the role and I haven't heard anything. Are you still, you know, did this position get filled? Are you still interviewing candidates? I'd love to continue, you know, the conversation if that's available. It'll show that you're proactive and really care about it, right? And that's another way to rise above the noise is showing that you're like, I want this job. Mm -hmm. It's not just another job that I'm spray and pray trying to get anything, but I'm being really diligent and I really want this role. I didn't hear from you, you know, and you can follow up a few, a few times. Like I'm a former salesperson, so constant follow-up is a thing. Um, and you can respectfully follow up a few times and at a certain point, let it go or you're back. <laughs> I agree completely. So like one big thing is don't count yourself out until you've actually been counted out. Um, I used to be a fundraiser, which was similar to sales or to recruiting. Um, until you get a clear no, assume best intent. They're busy. They're overloaded. They just haven't gotten to it. Continue to stay on their radar. The squeaky wheel does get the grease, um, but without getting to the annoyance part. And so I usually think of like every every week or so as being like a good rate as it's as you start to get like no response then even spacing out a couple weeks um, but in those follow-up pings again thinking about what do I have to offer in this message beyond just like hey I want to hear from you like hey what's going on there's a difference in like hey I saw this article about the company or that you're going in this new direction and I was really impressed by it really excited to continue having conversations about things like that or some other 
mention that you could reference to make it clear that you're they're staying top of mind for you and you want to stay top of mind for them but not just in a needy kind of way because then the other piece of it too is like to bring it to that dating analogy which i use dating analogies in job searching all the time because they're so similar <laughs> is 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 that um sometimes there's like a an assumption that ends up made on job seekers part that in order to like effectively get a job or have negotiation leverage that you need to play hard to get. And if you over disclose your excitement, that it's going to like undercut you later. And that's exactly not true. That in reality, companies want to hire people that are genuinely eager to be a part of this team and do this work because they know those are the people that are going to be loyal and committed and hardworking. And so showcasing and being persistent and saying, I'm excited about this. That's why I want to keep having these conversations um, is definitely worth your while to do. And don't be afraid that that's going to undercut you in negotiations later. So here I'll do a shameless plug that Zillow Group is hiring <laughs> and that Rachel and she plus Kate will be having a virtual That's group for and we will be part of it. Um, the only thing I do want to say during this time is the last couple of weeks, probably not just at my company, most companies, they're doing what we call sort of priority listing to figure out we're not hiring free. We're not we're having a hiring freeze, but we are prior prioritizing reps. Mm -hmm. So in, in Zillow's case, for example, we have uh, roles that are actually where you have to go into people's house, like estimate the cost and things like that. Obviously with shelter in place, that's not gonna work. So that is off our list. So relating to this question, I would say before you contact them, if especially it's been like, let's say a couple times, check if the role is still up. If the role is not up anymore, yeah. you can always do this proactive thing to say, hey, I noticed the role isn't up, so if you filled it, please let me know. Or if you're on a pause because of this COVID period, may I reach out again and continue this conversation two months from now? Yeah, that's and just to add to that is with this time, I mean, we're definitely seeing so many of the companies that we work with are having layoffs. The person who you might've been in touch with may not even be working at the company anymore. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's a great point. I'm thing. still there. I'm so glad. <laughs> but I think it's a great point to look at the website to see if the position is still open and recognize that, and yeah. then check the news to see if there were if there were significant layoffs, then that could be also why. Um, but those are the only legitimate excuses. <laughs> no kidding, your other reasons were great. Um, next question, is there a way to politely push back on a job test, i.e. a brand asking you to come up with a full marketing campaign mm -hmm. or new product idea. Mm -hmm. I've had my idea stolen and not been hired. That is so sad. <laughs> it's a great question. So I think it comes back to this idea of like self advocacy and knowing really like what you want and you're, you are interviewing the company as much as they're interviewing you, right? Like you're looking for that mutual fit. That's the sweet spot always is like, I've evaluated this and I've got the skill, strengths, interest, desire to be a part of this team. And they are in agreement that I've got the skill, strengths and right fit to, to make this work. Um, and if you feel taken advantage of in the hiring process, one thing is definitely like a the positive intent. I, I noticed with companies, a lot of them really haven't thought critically necessarily about the impression they're giving to job seekers in the various mm -hmm. stages that they take people through. So as like a side plug, I really wish that we could do a panel like this for companies and be like, hey, mm -hmm. maybe reconsider ghosting people or having them do full marketing plans. <laughs> yeah, <seriously. laughs> um, but in the meantime, right, what would it look like to assuming positive intent, say back, hey, I definitely want to be able to showcase my skills and talents. I think that this is I, that this is a really great fit. Here's some ideas of what I think would be really meaningful. And could we brainstorm on some kind of uh, like mechanism that's really going to give us both that best signal? Um, if you have confidence in your relationship with the recruiter, even like letting them know like this is um, I'm not I'm not you know, I don't feel super great about this piece of it, but I'm still really eager and excited. Let's work on it together. If the company says like, no way, no how, this is just how we do things, then it comes back to you in any negotiation to decide, does that work for me? Right? Do I want to work mm -hmm. at a company where that's the expectation, uh, where there's risk of something like my ideas being stolen in that way? And that might be the signal to you that it's not the right fit. Love it. Anybody else have anything to add? Yeah. Um, and it also depends what level you are you are applying for. I would say, um, especially in like head of product products or even you know higher, there is that ask to do that because the reason why they make that assumption is that perhaps you haven't been in the deep product 
uh, engagement or roadmap for a long time, especially if you've been a product manager for a company. So they might just want to test out like, are you still, you know, are you still up to date with some of these things? And that's the same thing for um, uh, like leadership roles for tech. Sometimes they might ask some coding question, not like a full on coding, but they just want to make sure that you're still, you know, understanding the challenges and, and, and what it would be. Um, and then the third thing, and, and I feel like I'm playing a devil's advocate, but I, I want to give sort of a behind the scenes why this sometimes happened is that some of the ideas, what you may think of stolen may already been in the works somehow, somehow like in discussion. So I'm not saying that it wasn't stolen, but that that's just a, like a potential in those cases, especially if it's um not general, but specific to the company because they probably have had, you know, a few times of thinking these things through. So that's all. Yeah, no, I agree with everything. Fabulous. That was said. Great. Um, I also love this next question. Um, any thoughts on how a gal who was raised to, quote, never brag about her accomplishments, go about the job search networking process without feeling like she's selling herself? Oh, so many ideas. <laughs> go forth. Yeah. Um, I think part of it is unlearning a bit the bragging piece. Talking about yourself and how awesome you are is not bragging. Like, I, there's so much of me that hates that especially women are taught this. Like, you are awesome. Own it. What I do with a lot of my clients is have them sit down and literally write out on a worksheet so they don't have to say it to me at first. Write down on a worksheet all of their skills and strengths, all of their accomplishments, the things that they, like, really love and get jazzed talking about so that they can, and then we start to talk about, okay, how do these things fit together? How do you want to talk about it? So by the time they practicing beforehand, by the time you get into that interview, it feels a little bit less awkward. Um, but, and also talking to like your friends and saying, Hey, you know, I'm kind of feeling uncomfortable about talking about these things. Like, what do you think is awesome about me? And hearing other people tell you like the things you're really rock star at is such a good feeling and it makes you realize that oh people know this about me it's not actually bragging it's just who i am and and moving into the story of owning yourself because you're the person that's really going to get yourself across the goal line you're the one who's going to get you to achieve the goals that you really want want for yourself and you have to be able to own it in order to do that a hundred percent. Yes, everything. Um, I think that actually the big, the biggest thing that stood out to me in this is that I, I don't think the goal is to get to a point of not feeling like you're selling yourself. It's to resolve the negative connotation of what it yeah. means to sell yourself, uh, because that is exactly how you want to show up is selling yourself. But from a really grounded place of confidence and not necessarily arrogance. And I hear bragging like I think of it as being conflated more with like an arrogant approach, which has much more to do with uh, like an inflated sense of self that's not grounded but confidence really comes from a rooting and like i've i've evaluated what i'm great at i've checked my facts i've looked at what those accomplishments are and the things that i've achieved i've talked to people that can be advocates to let me know like these are the things you're really great at um something that's great in the the job search process is to um request and ask for references on, or yeah, references on linkedin really easy function it's a great place to, to start to capture that and that can be a really good exercise in like boosting your self-confidence too um asking people to actually document these are the things that I know to be great about this person um, can really help you out uh, because it does come back to a lot of just negative messaging that we're conditioned and hear a lot especially as women growing up um, and when you look at like the proportion at which men apply to jobs versus women applying to jobs and like the skills alignment there we count ourselves out a lot because of this exact fact so if there was anything I would say like own selling yourself to be comfortable with selling yourself from that really grounded place. Yeah, I would say just think about if you don't actually do this, who's going mm -hmm. to be your advocate? Okay. Sure, you might have champions, maybe your mom loves you and will say you're great. But beyond that, that's kind of where it is. It's mm -hmm. also a mind shift of phrases we talk about ourselves, right? Like the famous thing to, it's, it's, you're not bossy, you actually have great leadership skills. I think those are all things that we're still battling. And the final thing I would say is 
we have this likability trap, right? So we keep thinking about if I say something, I want somebody to just notice that I'm great versus me having to tell them. But I think in kind of our pace and environment and the support system and structure that we have, this is actually a time to find champions and to reiterate why you are great and why you're proud of those accomplishments. Can I jump in with one more thing on that note, actually? That's, Jenny, so great. And it made me think of something um, with the likability uh, dichotomy um, is thinking about a communication styles and being seen as aggressive versus assertive. When I hear like bragging or that arrogance, it, it reads to me like, I'm afraid I'm gonna be aggressive if I put myself forward or if I try to sell myself. Um, and the difference in those two styles of communication actually just has to do with mindfulness of others. Aggressive and assertive both has to do with, a, with, with voicing, vocalizing, an opinion, a thought, a perspective. Aggressive is doing that without thought or consideration for the for other parties, whereas assertive is with consideration. And in the job searching context, hopefully you really are, you know, you're thinking about what the company needs in addition to what you're bringing to them. Well, everyone, I just had an idea and I'm going to make the ask to our community, but I'll start here. Like I'll put it in our newsletter and our Slack and everything. But I think especially now, um, given everything that's going on, I think it's particularly relevant. I love this idea of um, maybe doing an ask or doing an offer for actually doing an offer to do two references on LinkedIn mm -hmm. through your on your connections. If everybody in the SEO community did like two references to two other women in their community, it would just I think it could be a really cool thing. Yeah. So, and how good would that feel to randomly like get a recommendation from someone you didn't even ask? I mean, half of mine, I'm like, can you? Please yeah, that's actually true because everyone has to do it, right? So what if everyone's great? And then they're like, yeah, I'll do it. And then they don't. So like, you know, you can, you can. Wait, was that me? I think maybe I didn't do that, Karen. Oh, yeah. actually, yeah, that is. I mean, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I got one of my. I wasn't now. thinking about you. But Okay. Yeah, and the no, truth is, all like I mean, I just met technically Rachel online a couple no, of days totally. ago, and yeah. Caroline and Lacey and I have you know never worked together, but hopefully you couldn't tell. Hope you you could tell yeah. that. Oh, you know, I know all the things I'm going to say about you. <laughs> so, anyways, we're also you know making connections yeah. and networking. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Totally. Thank you for that. That's awesome. I want to go back to one other. Yes thing that Lacey had brought up around reframing this idea of like selling yourself. I think we, particularly as women, if you were not in a sales function, think that selling is icky and bad. <laughs> and honestly, it's how everything works. Everything in life is sales in some way. Um, Daniel H. Pink, if you know who he is, wrote a book that's called To Sell is Human, right? It is natural because we're connected, networking, group oriented beings. And it's constantly about getting people to uh, like us, notice us, connect with us, believe in what we're doing. And so even if you're not in a sales role, you're technically still selling. You have to get your colleagues bought in on the idea of a product or, you know, um, a new marketing plan or something. Um, but what if you just, and you don't think of that as like icky, right? So what if you think about the way you're talking about yourself, not as icky, but getting people bought in on who you are and what you can bring to the table. Yeah. So just another thing to reframe. Love that. Takes a lot of therapy, I think, but yes, <laughs> love that. <laughs> it's hard. I mean, it possibly, <laughs> a lot of retraining. Yeah, coaching. Sorry. Yeah, coaching. yeah, yeah. You got it. You got it. You got it. You got it. Oh, therapy yeah. too. Both of them. Both are great. <laughs> um, great. Next question. Um, how do you time using your network with submitting an application? If you wait to apply to leverage your network beforehand, is there a risk of a job posting closing being late? That's a great question. That is a great question. I would say um, always trying to leverage your network as your first your first course of action, because if you look at the statistics on how likely you are to actually have success in just applying again to kind of like an ATS or to a, like this, this black hole versus having that direct connection, it's so low that even if you risk the job posting closing or you're going to be late on it, it's still higher odds if you are leveraging that, that network connection and you might have a lot more context. The other piece of it too is that a lot of, especially with larger companies, if somebody is submitting a referral, uh, they actually are able to generate like a, a unique link or, or access point for that application that they can then help you in tracking. They can let you know updates. Oh, we see that it, it went, it passed to, you know, this team member. So you have somebody advocating and letting you know and keeping you posted through the pipeline. And also um, a lot of larger companies give referral bonuses. And so, yes, hopefully anybody in your network is motivated to support you because 
they care. Uh, but also if there is a financial incentive in there for them as well, um, that's just like a win-win all around. And so giving them access to that opportunity as well is, is important. Yeah. And who wouldn't mind 5K for engineering referral right. in many companies, really? many, many companies. Yeah. Um, yeah. The only thing I just want to add, I think this is related to when you're doing application. I would say if you're not looking for a job now, keep your networking. The networking should not be when you're like, oh, no, I need to talk to someone now, but just kind of building it, whether that was alum that someone mentioned or uh, previous coworkers or asking people for, you know, um, uh, just recommendations. All of those are networking. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. I think the only time that I would say if you're if there's an actual deadline for a job, mm -hmm. right? So some some are like we're taking applications to a certain date and you you aren't able to connect to someone beforehand. OK, go ahead and do the job application first. Um, but if you can use your network beforehand, I would always, always do that. Love it. Um, what are best practices when doing company research? If you're interested in startups, what are the signs they're doing well, increasing revenue, and have runway for a while to continue in their business? And I, I will say for me, and Carolyn knows this, I'm obsessed with a website called Crunchbase. Like any company yeah. that reaches out to me, I or that I want to research, I look and it has when it, when they got their latest funding. So if you see that they just got like 20 million in funding in the past year, I feel like unless they're a travel company or a restaurant company, they'd probably be okay right now. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think doing that prep research on, on Crunch, I love Crunchbase as well. It's an awesome resource. Doing that in advance, absolutely. Um, it, but it has a lot to do with the time, what part of the interview process you're in also with a company. Um, so I wanted to also speak to um, in, if you have applied and you're, you're going through an active interview process, you really want to focus as much as you can in those early conversations, those first couple interviews and screens on is there mutual fit here? Is the position, the scope of this role, the problems they needed mm -hmm. to solve? Am I the right fit for it? Is this a, something I want to even be working on with people I want mm -hmm. to be working with? Um, and then as you're looking as, at the negotiation process, if an offer comes up or as you're approaching that, that's a really great point to start asking critical questions of them. Um, thinking about it as like a dating courtship at that state, once they've decided you're a good mutual fit, they're starting to woo you. And so sharing that kind of information with you where you have confidence that you want to join them, it's a great opportunity to not only ask these questions, but also even asking, is there somebody, um, an investor that I could chat with? Like, I, is there somebody you could put me in touch mm -hmm. with um, that I could have a informational conversation with just to understand what motivated them to invest in the company where they see it going in addition to like the internal team's perspective on some of those questions. I would jump in and also say that before you even start company research, get really clear on what's important in a company for you. Mm -hmm. Right, so based on that question, there's a value around startups, they're in a growth phase, they're, you know, you're looking at how long are they gonna be around? Um, whereas other people might say, okay, I want someone that's actually a very established company, has been around for a long time. Um, I want, the values are really important. So um, for me, anytime I'm looking at a company, I wanna see on their website that they show the different values that they use as a company, right? And they call out them and give examples of them and make sure that they line up with what my values are too. So before you even dive into that research, it's like getting clear on what's very important for you because then you'll be able to quickly realize, oh, okay, based on what they're showing, this may not be a good fit or actually, wow, I'm really, really interested in this company. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's my, yeah. where I always I start. I guess my little ad, if it's specifically like revenue and how their business doing is, you know, do they put, all their eggs in one basket? Do they diversify their portfolio? Are they reinventing themselves? Mm -hmm. I don't know how many times Apple reinvented themselves, you know, but they never lost the core of their creative company. So without losing what their core value is, but you're still seeing them changing with the times, changing with the interest, like those are businesses that is thinking ahead. Um, so I know, for example, like Zoom and Blue Jeans. I think Blue Jeans just got bought by Google, yeah. right? Like these, they're up and com uh, companies that you can think about. Where wow, they have larger competitors, or maybe their competitors are trying to diversify. So maybe some of these small startups, a lot of them do have exit plans, which is to be bought out. And so kind of doing that kind of research is fun. It's more of a competitive intelligence 
um, not just for that company, but really for the industry. One more thing, just to jump on the ideas of that values alignment too, um, is sometimes it can be hard if you know critic, like you've got your core values figured out and you know exactly what you need in a work environment to feel successful um, and supported, um, how to find companies that align with that versus like finding companies and then looking at those values. And so a resource and a website that I really love is keyvalues.com, which is a site where you can go and you can plug in and select your top few values. And it, it gives you a list of companies that have also selected those values, whether on their website or through partnership with key values. Um, it's mostly for engineering types of functions, but it can give you a great overview just of like, oh, these companies' values align with mine. That is so cool. That's a great one. I haven't heard of that. Yeah. Thank you. Well, we'll, we'll include that in the show notes. That's for those. <laughs> yeah. I, I, have I love a, that. I have a collected list of resources because I wasn't sure where these questions were going and then we would have to look for these. Um, so I was just going to paste some um, that I've yeah. collected. And I know Lacey and Caroline have a bunch as well so yeah that's great what we'll do is we'll get all the resources and we'll make it into this awesome thing and we'll send it to the world obviously to the people who participated in this first but then the universe <laughs> um so next question as so much work is being done remotely at the moment um this person's been applying to jobs and locations they wouldn't consider otherwise is it bad to immediately express interest in working remotely long term I think it makes sense to get clear on if that company is going to allow you to work remote on the end of all of this. Um, that may change. I think I think this whole pandemic is drastically going to change how companies um, force or not people to come into the office. And they, it's going to be a little bit hard to roll back some of the, um, no, you have to be in the office because look, we've been proving we're able to do work not there. But um, I think if they're expecting you to be able to come into the office, for that job, that should be a transparent conversation because you don't want to get into a place where you're like, oh no, I'm not going to move to whatever state or city, or I don't want to commute that far. Um, so getting clear with them, I think is actually really important. Especially if it's a non-negotiable, right? So this comes down to being like really clear with yourself. If I am not willing to work for a company that won't allow me to work remotely long-term, then yes, I should definitely mention this early on because that's gonna go to that idea of mutual fit. If it's more open-ended and you're like, I could, be, I could be swayed, I could be willing to move, then it might be okay to save that conversation for a little bit later in the process uh, because it's not a make or break it for you. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I would say, companies are pretty clear from the get-go whether this is going to be full-time or remote. So they'll specify specify that specifically on their job site, but also they would then put um, roles on specific re remote job sites as well. So I think that would kind of help with the mystery of it, but I agree with Caroline and Lacey, you need to set that expectation or understand what is feasible ahead of time. Actually, I wanted to also mention another resource, um, a company that I found out about. It's a startup um, called placement.com, and they're, um, a ta they're, they're talent agents, um, so a different type of recruitment type of model, but they specialize in helping people find jobs outside of the location that they happen to live in. Um, now that everything is going remote, it's even more kind of open-ended, I think, for them, and that's another creative approach is to find somebody that specializes in that type of relocation support. Okay, so we have a problem because we have way too many questions and only 11 minutes left. Ah, there, we haven't even, we only got, to, we, yeah, we only got to one. So I'm gonna- Should we go to the one thing ahead? Yeah, I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna sort of cherry pick a little bit some of the questions um, based on the way this is going. And um, so one question I, uh, that someone asked is in today's uh, climate, what are some of the pros and cons of searching for and taking any job just as a short term foot in the door for the industry versus taking more time to get an ideal job? Uh, I think that comes down to a couple of things. One, your personal comfort. Um, and if you're willing, like if you're financially, eight, say you're not in a, you're unemployed right now, how, what kind of a runway do you have? Right. So if you don't have a long one, you may need to just find a job and, and that's okay if that's the situation. But if you have more of a runway, you may feel more comfortable saying, you know what, I'm going to hold off till I find the right thing. And it's a lot of it has to do with your own personal preference um, when it comes to that, that type of um, decision, in my opinion. Does anybody yeah. else wanna add? I yeah. would echo that. I mean, not all severances are created equal. 
So you have ones where it's just two weeks. And then recently, Carta, who laid off 160 plus people, the CEO wrote this beautiful note and the compassion that came out of it is different. So they gave three months severance plus health benefits. So mm. I share that to show, show you it's just different situation, you know, for everyone. And so agree with Caroline that it's going to be really assessing that what you what kind of risk you can take. Um, so anyways, that that's kind of my tidbit. Yes. And to add to that, too, the idea of an ideal job, I really I don't think that there's any such thing as a perfect job. I think there's an ideal next step for us. But that I, again, that idea of we own our story we can redefine what our ideal next step is as long as we've got clarity on the direction that we wanna be moving. So even if a position isn't ideal for some kind of reasons, how do you make it ideal or find other things about it that are beyond just like it's a job and it's gonna you know, give me a paycheck? Are there other things you can get excited about or things that you see, skills you'll be able to develop in that role that will get you closer to that ideal job once the market shifts and things hopefully recover? Love it. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with taking a mm -hmm. stepping stone if you need to. Um, and if you are in a role, you know, again, if you are in a job and you don't need a new job, but you want a new job right now, you can again assess, is it, do I find value in just getting into the industry and the job itself is sort of important, but not totally important? Or do I put more value in finding the right next true fit for me in terms of, you know, what I want next? I would say the next thing you take regardless if it's trying to get you into the industry or is a better ideal for you should be getting you in the longer term direction you want to, you want to go. Well said. Um, and another question from the survey, what are some strategies for taking remote interviews while you still have a job with a boss that is micromanaging your time, which I think is so interesting in the world of remote work. Uh, I feel a little facetious at first of like, if you've got this micromanager, no wonder you're looking for a new job. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sorry, that's your experience. I have been so frustrated and confused, frankly, just like kerfuddled, like completely bamboozled by this idea of people micromanaging in this pandemic, like the intensity of focus being placed on productivity when we're not just working from home, we're working from home during a time of collective trauma in completely mm -hmm. uncertain and unprecedented times. And like, we all need compassion and leadership needs to show that. And I think companies that have not shown that compassion effectively or managers, like those things, people remember those things. Um, and so that's just like my gut heart reaction um, to that. Uh, but then it really comes down to like, who whose best interest do you have at heart right now, right? You're you're advocating for yourself in this. And so it's in your best interest to carve out that time. So what is the, the PTO policy? What is the time off policy? Uh, maybe it's not ideal uh, to be taking that time off if you have limited, but if it's going to get you closer to your next job and out of this negative situation, then it's worth it to, to kind of spend on that paid time off. And you don't need to disclose what you're using that paid time off for. Um, so, you know, people are taking paid time off right now to, to lay on their couch and stare at the ceiling because we're all just overwhelmed. And so if you're using that time effectively for you, wonderful. And they don't need to know that. Right on. Does anybody else have anything totally. to add? Awesome. I'm going to go no, back. So I'm going to go back to the Q&A. And just I want to acknowledge about the resource question. So we don't have to talk about it specifically here because we'll put in a list um, and send that out. So we can go to the next question, which I love, which is, do you have any advice for keeping motivated during a job search? It can be long and tiring, and sometimes it goes really fast and you kind of don't know what you're in for. And so I think for the times where it takes a long time, it's reminding yourself that like, you're awesome. You just haven't found the right thing yet. And actually the fact that you're getting no's or not making a ton of headway into certain opportunities to me is like, okay, I just haven't found the thing that is really meant for me. And by these no's, I'm getting opened up to this other opportunity coming. Um, it can be very hard to be in that mindset <laughs> when you're in it. Um, but as much as you can kind of create that mantra for yourself of like, it's, it, it's okay, there, is, there will be something at the end of the tunnel to me, the better. 
I think too, in that creating some, oh, sorry, Jenny, to create some stru- go ahead, go ahead, structure for yourself as well. I think when you're job searching, it can bleed into like ev- and ooze into like every bit of your life. And this feeling like any time, if you have a job right now and you're searching on the side, that every moment you're not doing your day job, you should be working on that. Or if you don't have a, a job at the moment and you're searching, that that's just like, it can, it can be all consuming and it's impossible to stay motivated when you're burnt out. Um, and so being really realistic with yourself too, about like, how do I manage this in a way and create my own structure where daily there is some movement happening. I've got a target of three networking messages a day or something like that. But if I at least get that done, I can feel accomplished. And anything above that is the gravy on top uh, to really pace yourself out in addition to then finding ways to, to fill that cup and take care of yourself. Own a friend. No, <laughs> um, I would, yeah, I'm losing my voice. Um, I would say, you know, I think at some point somebody talked about accountability partners mm. and it's kind of the same thing with having um, someone that will kind of be your motivator. Um, I know people go to, I'm sure you might have a recruiter friend who might give you tips or another coach that might give you tips. So it's just surrounding yourself with people that actually know what's happening behind the scenes that can actually tell you what you're feeling is normal. The fact that on average it takes five plus months on a non-COVID you know, a scenario to find that whatever that job is, even though there's nothing ideal, right, They see, but the job that's right for you at this moment, um, it's, it's, it can be a long journey. So you kind of need that support um, and motivation in that way. And I think keeping kind of going along with the like having things for yourself, just keeping your momentum up too, right? And like, making sure that yes, it's not being all of your time, but you are spending some time so that you don't, it's like that there can be that like fits and starts thing that happens if you're like all consumed too quickly. And then you're like, okay, wait, I need to back off, but keeping the momentum. Cause all of a sudden you'll be like, oh, I have multiple oper- things in the pipeline kind of thing. It, it is a little bit of a numbers mm-hmm. game and letting yourself understand that it just, it, it's just, a, you kind of just have to keep going. Rachel, this is great. Can I ask a quick logistics yes. question? I'm seeing that there's like a lot of really yeah. cool chat happening, but I can't I look at it. Will that get saved? And can we re- read it after this? You know, I'm, I was actually going to mention it myself, and I was literally just looking to see where the download function is, which I don't see. So I was going to tell everyone that, yeah, there's like this whole other like side chat conversation that's happening. I honestly think we should just do more of these sessions. I think there's a lot of questions that people are having right now. And I think we'll get more people involved. So we'll, we will do this again. Um, and I actually, I'm going to stop questions now because I know uh, we only have uh, a couple of minutes and just a logistical weird thing that I'm going to have to do for part of this platform is I'm going, once I end the presentation, um, I have to rename all the tables. So just bear with me as I rename all the tables and I want to make sure that everybody, <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. Uh, I want to make sure that everybody gets as much time with the with the coaches as possible um, and recognizing that we definitely have a lot of other questions. So please know we will absolutely be doing this again, maybe just specifically on job searching in the age of Rona. I sadly don't think it's going to end anytime soon. So uh, I hope it does. But um, yeah, so let me just go and do that now and just thank you so much. Um, y'all are amazing. Thanks, thank you. And thanks for having us. Yeah, and thanks so much for the coaches on the chat to like fill in also. So teamwork. I love uh, it. Teamwork is a dream love it. All right. See y'all on the webinar in an hour. In the meantime, have a good time.